night. Congress mobilizes on the FBI firing. Director Comey enjoyed broad support within the FBI and still does to this day. Gay men under attack and Democrats harness health care outrage. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement announced today that it's arrested more than 1,300 suspected gang members in its biggest gang sweep ever. Let me be clear that these violent criminal street gangs are the biggest threat facing our communities. 450 of the people arrested were foreign nationals, including three DACA recipients, and may be deported. The mayor of New Orleans says the city will continue what he calls its march to reconciliation after the second of four Confederate statues was removed. The statue of former Confederate President Jefferson Davis had been in place for 106 years. Surrounded by protesters from both sides, workers wore bulletproof vests, masks, and dark clothes to hide their identities after getting threats from people who didn't want the statues removed. Volunteers and workers collected four tons of garbage from Mount Everest. More than 100 yaks transported the trash down the mountain. Each year, about 60,000 people visit the north side of Everest, leaving behind cans, plastic bags, oxygen tanks, and other climbing equipment. There's believed to be at least 50 tons of garbage left on the mountain. President Trump signed an executive order creating a commission to investigate, quote, electoral integrity. The experts and officials on this commission will follow the facts where they lead. Meetings and hearings will be open to the public for comments and input. That's despite the fact that there's no evidence to support Trump's claims of widespread illegal voting in the 2016 election. Addressing the first ever World Summit on the Persecution of Christians, Vice President Pence said no other religious group faces greater hostility and hatred. And I believe ISIS is guilty of nothing short of genocide against people of the Christian faith. And it is time the world called it by name. Today, President Trump decided to clarify who it was that fired FBI Director James Comey. I was going to fire Comey, my decision. It was not- You had made the decision before they came in the I, room. I was going to fire Comey. The problem is, that directly contradicts the message his staff had been pushing, that it was the Deputy Attorney General who first suggested making the move. He provided strong leadership to act on the recommendation of the Deputy Attorney General. The White House has officially made a mess of its explanations, which is inviting more questions than ever about President Trump meddling in the investigations into the Trump team. The Senate Intelligence Committee spent the morning interrogating Andrew McCabe, who's now running the FBI in Comey's place. Director Comey enjoyed broad support within the FBI, and still does to this day. The hearing wasn't even supposed to be about the FBI firing, but it illustrated a new reality. The Intelligence Committee is quickly becoming the leading edge of the effort to hold the White House accountable. Josh Hirsch explains. There are different ways that the government can investigate the president. Congressional committees are one of them. But a lot of people are also calling for independent investigations, like appointing a special counsel in the office of the attorney general or creating a bipartisan commission along the lines of what was done after 9-11. Both of those options might sound appealing, but they also both have issues. A commission has to be approved by the president, something that almost certainly won't happen. And a special counsel would serve at the discretion of the deputy attorney general, who's a Trump appointee. There are rules and norms that are supposed to guard against the president interfering with that kind of investigation, but Trump has given us a lot of reasons to think that norms are not really his thing. Like acknowledging today that he discussed the Russian investigation with former FBI director James Comey before firing him. That's not illegal, but it's also not how you maintain the appearance of impartiality. This leaves a lot of responsibility to Congress, specifically the Senate Intelligence Committee and its chairman, Senator Richard Burr. In February, Burr raised some doubts about his approach 
when he participated in calls to reporters arranged by the White House to defend the president. The committee was also accused of not properly staffing the investigation and failing to call key witnesses. And of course, like every committee on the Hill, it has more members from the majority party than the minority. But Senate intel is probably the best option left. Congressional investigations are the only ones that presidents can't directly interfere with. And Burr has now taken a stronger line on the process, hiring more staff and slapping former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn with a subpoena. We issued our first subpoena. Uh, I, hope it's not, I hope it's our last because everything else might be voluntary, but in the absence uh, of voluntary participation, we're willing uh, to go to whatever basket of tools we feel is necessary. People don't like Congress, and they might not want to trust it with a sensitive investigation. But it does have one asset that suddenly seems really important. Insulation from the West Wing. Last night in Willingboro, New Jersey, Representative Tom MacArthur faced a couple hundred angry constituents for about five hours. Nobody with a pre-existing condition will either be declined coverage or be priced out of uh, being able to buy insurance. Let me finish. Massive anger at Republican town halls isn't even news anymore. A room full of angry voters a year and a half before the next midterm election is the new normal for Republican lawmakers across the country. And it has been since January. MacArthur's crowd was particularly fired up because he wrote the amendment that saved the House Republicans' health care bill. Health care is personal. It's one of the few political issues that are really about your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And that gives it a special power to both elect and unelect politicians. So even as the firing of James Comey has taken over the news, a top official of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the arm of the Democratic Party charged with defeating guys like MacArthur, says health care is the issue they care about. Right now, I, I would say health care is still at the top of the minds of voters. The DCCC, as it's called in Washington, is spending money today to keep needling Republicans over health care. Staffers are already on the ground in some states, and the group is running ads. And House Republicans voted yes. Every Republican is a target, even those who voted against the health care bill. If you vote no, you're still in trouble, is your yeah, take on 100%, this? Yeah, 100%. Because the, almost every House Republican played a role in moving this bill forward. Whether it was a vote in January, which, which was a procedural vote, but it, it was the first step towards repeal, widely recognized that way. Willingboro is a Democratic section of MacArthur's Purple District. But many in the crowd said they weren't Democrats. They'd never been to MacArthur Town Hall before, and they were there to talk about health care. I have fibromyalgia. Okay. I look normal, but I suffer from pain every single day. We just got them to acknowledge this as a disease. Now you're going to say that disease is supposed to cost me more money? Because we're going to kill the bill! This has happened before, back in 2009. The Tea Party included a lot of people who were frustrated with both parties, but they voted Republican in part to punish Democrats over health care. Do you worry that opponents of people like Tom MacArthur won't be able to keep that kind of no. motivation? No, I think, I think we're going to make the Tea Party look like uh, amateurs. like three calls that a parent doesn't want to get. My child is hurt, my child has been imprisoned, or my child has been suspended. I get a call from my child's school to come and pick my child up. He's been sent home. He was in circle time. The teacher assistant went to go pick him up and he hit her hand. They said that was basically an assault on the teacher. Trizel Underwood's son is four years old and goes to pre-K in the Austin School District. He's been suspended three times. Underwood asked that we not name his school. I picked him up the first time, and I picked him up the second time, and I think the third call, I was mad. I didn't want this to be another young African-American boy labeled instantly. School is this place that's leading him, I, I feel, to prison. 
Now, I, I do have a fear that a lot of our kids are going to this school to prison pipeline. In Texas elementary schools last year, there were 26,183 out-of-school suspensions for students in second grade or younger. Suspensions have a disproportionate impact on Black students, who make up 13% of the elementary school student body, but account for 47% of the suspensions. According to the Department of Education, young students who are suspended are as much as 10 times more likely to drop out of high school, experience academic failure, and face incarceration than those who are not. Hoping to disrupt the school-to-prison pipeline, the Texas legislature is currently considering three bills that would ban out-of-school suspensions for pre-K through second grade. Raising the question, if suspensions are banned, what are teachers supposed to do instead? This is of great concern to teachers like Hannah Terry, who campaigned for a suspension ban in her school district that passed earlier this year. It is definitely not enough to just ban it because my fear is that if it's banned without proper training and resources, then people are just going to give a different name to the same thing. State Representative Helen Giddings is the author of one of the state bills. Her bill requires that schools come up with research-based alternatives to suspensions. If we're not going to be able to suspend students, then we need to have alternative measures to deal with behavioral problems. We all want our students to be able to go to school and to be able to learn in an atmosphere that is free of disruption. Her bill wasn't prioritized to be heard by the House before tonight's midnight deadline. So the bill died. But an identical bill could be heard in the Senate as early as tomorrow. The third doesn't suggest alternatives, but bans suspensions anyway. It passed in the House on Tuesday and is now on its way through the Senate. Morgan Craven, director of the School to Prison Pipeline Project at Texas Appleseed, believes that even if the state doesn't agree on an alternative, out-of-school suspensions should still be eliminated. We can't keep doing something that we 100% know hurts children. There's no question that suspensions are bad. There's no reliable research that says that they are good. And so we have to stop doing what we know is, is bad for kids. Five LGBT activists have been detained in Russia's capital, Moscow, after trying to deliver a petition to the country's prosecutor general, calling for an investigation into the alleged abuse of hundreds of gay men in Chechnya. The Russian LGBT network says the petition is signed by two million people around the world, responding to reports that more than a hundred men were rounded up and tortured in Chechnya, and at least three killed. David is a Chechen in his mid-30s. He has a wife and family, but he's also gay. We're not using his real name and we're disguising his voice because he's scared of reprisals for exposing the abuse against him by Chechen police earlier this year. Меня забрало несколько сотрудников, привезли в изолятор временного содержания. В тот же вечер меня, как впрочем и других, начали пытать. Chechnya is an ultra-conservative Muslim society, ruled by Ramzan Kadyrov, an authoritarian allied with Moscow. Initially, the Chechen government said that the reports of systematic abuse couldn't be true, because there were no gay men in Chechnya. The allegations first surfaced at the beginning of last month. The first known cases of detention and torture happened in February. David fled Chechnya in early April after hearing police were looking for him again. 
He was also afraid that his own family would turn against him. He eventually made it to Moscow, where he got in touch with the Russian LGBT network. The newspaper Novaya Gazeta broke the story in April. They'd become aware of the first cases, including David's, in the middle of March. Outside its offices, there's a memorial to Anna Politkovskaya, one of its journalists who was shot dead after reporting extensively on Chechnya. Since they published, there have been many new threats. После нашей первой публикации власти Чечни собрали в центральной мечети города Грозного около 15 тысяч человек, и они провели такое некое собрание, на котором призвали, и что, значит, надо призвать новую газету к ответу, и сказали, что вот за такие провокации будут возмездия. И, а с другой стороны, на что напирают чеченские власти, что мы оскорбляем ислам. President Kadyrov crushes any form of dissent, making him a useful, if distasteful, ally to Vladimir Putin. When Putin and Kadyrov met a few weeks ago, Putin called allegations of abuse against gay people, quote, provocative. He's since promised to get his authorities to investigate what he'll still only call rumors. David is now trying to leave Russia completely, for a European country where his sexual orientation won't put his life in danger or make him an outcast. This is Regina Joseph. She can predict the future. She's known as a super forecaster. Hedge funds and governments hire her to predict world events. Tell me about a question you're currently forecasting. Everybody's interested in seeing how the Trump effect might migrate over to Europe. So we have an open question as to whether or not Gerd Wilders, who is leader of a party known as the PVV, whether his party will achieve 35 or more seats in the Dutch parliament. If I were to make a forecast on it today, I would say that uh, I would be actually below 50% right now. Okay, and who is the client? I'm not at liberty to say. Um, it would be fair to say that it's a, it's a government client. So how does Regina predict these things? She mainly Googles them. What is the season for bird flu? If she's predicting whether there'll be an outbreak of bird flu, she Googles whether it's flu season. Watching her work kind of kills the clairvoyant mystique. You think, oh, I could do that. Does it ever feel strange to you that you're just sitting in your apartment in New York forecasting like elections around the world or swine flu events or epidemics? It's probably not half as sexy as, um, you know, that sort of minority report precog. I'm not floating in any ectoplasm or anything like that. So we're not these mythical unicorn beings. We're human beings. We're fallible. The question is, are you getting more right? questions than getting wrong questions, that's where the, that's where the sweet spot is. It might seem like Regina has figured out a clever way to separate hedge funds from their money. But the government's highly trained intelligence agents aren't necessarily any better at predicting the future. You may remember in 2002, the U.S. invaded Iraq on the grounds that it had weapons of mass destruction. But none were found. It was a colossal, embarrassing intelligence failure. Which is why in 2006, Congress created IARPA for Intelligence Advanced Research Projects, a government think tank that develops alternative intelligence tools that are used by other government agencies and private companies. IARPA's research has been used in Google's facial recognition systems. In 2011, IARPA launched a tournament called the Good Judgment Project to test people's forecasting ability. There were about 20,000 participants. Regina landed in the top 150. Eventually, you can take the insights from Dr. That. Jason Matheny used to work at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. He once wrote a paper titled Reducing the Risk of Human Extinction. Now he runs IARPA. IARPA's budget is classified. A lot about IARPA is classified. 
We're not allowed to show you any part of the building aside from one windowless room. You're not missing much. It seems kind of hard to believe that a regular person with a few Google searches could be a better predictor than a subject matter expert. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's really counterintuitive. I think this gets to what's sometimes called the paradox of expertise, in which experts uh, start to get blinders on so that they're only looking at the same sources of data. Uh, they're only going with the same mental models or hypotheses that they've already generated about the world. People who are most accurate uh, not only tended to be deeply self-critical and humble about what they knew, they didn't trust their instincts much. That's not a trait that most of us have. This is the DC Matheny campus. says the goal yeah, of IARPA is to encourage better, less biased research, and that even minor improvements in intelligence can make a big difference. If we improve the intelligence community's ability to make judgments about billion dollar or trillion dollar decisions, even a 10% improvement, and then when you think about the ability to uh, prevent wars, the ability to uh, avoid global catastrophic risks. I mean, the returns from those kinds of investments are huge. IARPA says its tools offer a 30 to 50% improvement in accuracy on national intelligence questions for government agencies. Whether it can actually stop a war remains an open question. Since succeeding in the Good Judgment Project, Regina's services have been in high demand. Although Regina's tactics might seem simple, she turned out to be right on that question about the Dutch elections. Builder's party won just 20 seats. We're able to deal with our biases a little bit better than the average person. We're able to accumulate, uh, gather, process, and th synthesize information in a way that most people don't. And more importantly, we're really curious. I think that we're not built like the average bear. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, May 11th. Tune in tomorrow night for the award-winning documentary series, Vice. Anybody that's born in this next decade has a greatly increased chance of living into triple digits. More than 1,000 centenarians wow. for the past 30 years. Why is Okinawa unique in terms of its longevity? DNA is different.